So I wanted to follow up on a video that I did about saving a little bit of money by editing on an external SSD. Well, some of you weighed in about some of the options that I had recommended and even recommending some faster external SSDs. Well, today I actually have one of the fastest external SSD options out there and we're gonna be talking about it. You know I got some notes. Let's go. What is going on, you beautiful humans? Welcome back to the channel. And hey, if you are new around here, welcome. YouTube's open 24 seven. I just happen to take a nap every now and again, so you're not late. Now, that being said, what I actually wanted to do is follow up on a video that I did when I talked about saving some money editing on an external SSD, especially when it comes to the new M1 Max. And that's something that we're actually gonna be talking about. Now, for those of you that are interested in several parts of this video or various parts that you may want to skip to, I'm creating timestamps within the video so that you can point yourself in that direction to wherever you need to be. Now, what I am doing here is I am going to be talking about one of the fastest external SSD setups, and this is a DIY setup, and many of you have reached out about NVMe drives and Thunderbolt 3 enclosures, so this is what I have today. And what we're gonna be doing is bringing you behind the scenes. So I'm gonna be bringing you, doing a little BTS, showing you some workflow with a 4K timeline, that Sony A7S III footage that I have featured before, but a little bit different this time where I have removed all the render files, any optimization or anything like that because I had background render on in that last video. So if you haven't checked that out, I will link that up. But I did have background render on, but in this one, I've removed all of the render files. So we are going to run through that, that timeline and show you scrubbing through it. We're going to render it from start to finish, and then we're gonna to export to a ProRes 422. Now what I've invested in is a PCIe Gen 4 SSD, an NVMe SSD that I have actually put in this fledging uh, enclosure that is Thunderbolt 3 uh, compatible. So it is at Thunderbolt 3 speeds, whereas with the SanDisk and something like the Samsung T7, you're talking about a 3.1 Gen 2 USB where you're not going to get the full benefits of Thunderbolt 3. Let me quickly offer some context when we talk about this PCIe Gen 4 SSD from Silicon Power in that it has rated and advertised read and write speeds of 5,000 megabytes per second and 4,400 megabytes per second respectively. The thing is, is that if you install it inside of a PC with a motherboard that can, that can accept a Gen 4 SSD like this, then you will get closer to those read and write speeds. However, for Thunderbolt 3, regardless of the machine that you're using, although we will talk about what's happening with the M1 Max, but you're not going to get those advertised speeds. So that is just full context, just so that you know. Now, before we get in behind the scenes, let's actually talk about setting up this enclosure because it's fairly easy to do. Now, for this DIY setup, what you're gonna wanna do is with the enclosure, you're gonna remove the screws from this enclosure and this enclosure is aluminum. Now, once those are removed, you'll also notice that there's a screw on the board itself and that one screw is what actually holds in the SSD. Now, you'll notice as far as the connections are concerned that the NVMe can fit in basically one way. So go ahead and line up the SSD and gently advance it in. Now, of course, you'll notice that it pops up a bit, but that's actually normal. So gently push the SSD down and secure it to the board. Then there's actually some optional thermal tape that you can apply on top of the SSD and actually prefer to leave the sticker from the SSD on, so I just put the thermal tape on top of that. Now, one of the main reasons why I did choose this enclosure was the fact that it does have an internal fan, which runs at idle, but it'll kick up every now and again, and it sounds like a very faint, like distant wind. Um, it's not something that I really like pay attention to or pick up, and it only lasts for like a second, and then it just sort of cycles just as the SSD is being used for like large transfers or even editing. Why don't we go ahead and bring you in behind the scenes where I test out the Thunderbolt 3 enclosure along with the Silicon Power Gen 4 M2 SSD, but I also make a comparison with the SanDisk Extreme Pro. All right, here we are in the timeline and one of the things that I wanted to do, so we are on the NVMe with the enclosure and so no background rendering happening. All of the render files have been removed. The timeline's changed just a little bit, but all of the those transitions and uh, correction is is in there. But what I wanted to show you is kind of playing through this 
with, like I said, no background render on like it was on last time. We're gonna hit some third-party transitions here. Third-party transition right there, third-party plugin, and just kind of moving right along. Anything that you see is because obviously, um, and it's actually holding up pretty well as far as the frames, but yeah, if I put stabilization or any kind of um, uh, optical flow in there, like I said, it hasn't been rendered, but it's it's holding up really well. And I just, you'll see that the status bar hasn't changed at all. Moving through that transition. Another third party plugin, still moving. And of course, if I wanted to just kind of move through the timeline, scrub through, wanted to come back. Or go back here, same thing. Still working through it, holding up as far as playback is concerned. All right, so now what we're gonna do is gonna go render everything um, before we do export. So last time I shared numbers with just the export and of course we had the background render on. So let's actually see what that looks like as far as rendering everything. So we are going to render all and I am going to see what that takes. And I'll see you back here. All right, so that was the render. And what we'll then do is we will go for the export. So again, um, that's how, if I don't have background render on, that's, that's what I would do. I would obviously check the clips, make sure stabilization, uh, optical flow, any of the transitions, everything was working. So that's done. And then the next thing I would do is we will export it to ProRes for Apple ProRes 422. And then we'll see what that takes. And I'll see you back here after that. All right, now what we're gonna do is switch over, do everything, rinse and repeat on the sand disk, see what we get. All right, so we're here on the sand disk, same setup, rinse and repeat here. As you'll see, this task has not been performed, render files, anything that had been optimized or rendered in the previous one, that's all done, all gone. And so as you'll see, we'll just play through, I think this was kind of the same spot where we were last time, playing through that, third-party plug-in. Again, one of the things I will tell you is that from Pixel Film Studio, certain plugins that I have, transitions are working just fine. Not all of them, and I certainly can't list them all out. You'll just have to kind of go to the website. Any kind of um, jumping around, again, stabilization, if it's been applied, or optical flow, you're not going to see that. Let's... Take a look. So handling the playback pretty well. Transitions right there. Again, as you'll see, it's still moving. Adjustment layer. Of course, that slowed down. And if we want to move through the timeline, play that clip that slowed down. Timeline here. Certain come over to these clips. <laughs> I 
nothing's moving in this clip. Just the leaves. All right. Why don't we do a render test on the sand disk, see what we get, and I'll catch you back here in a minute. All right. That's interesting. So maybe 22 seconds longer on the extreme. All right. So why don't we go ahead and see what that export's going to look like? Same deal. Do a master file. ProRes 422. And we will do test two because I think there's already another one in here. Stream, pop it in. And again, I'll see you right back here. So we've already passed 726. We've already passed what the NVMe did, but not by much because we're at 91% and usually it'll kind of kick over pretty quick here. But yeah, like I said, I just wanted to show you that RAM every time I talk about it. Ooh, there we go. All right, got my notes here because I couldn't memorize everything. Now, one of the biggest strengths I think as far as these NVMEs and taking advantage of that Thunderbolt 3 is as video editors, we're moving large files. So moving a, an over 400 gigabyte folder from the internal on the M1 to the NVMe, we actually found that that only took about three minutes. Now the peak read and write was 502 megabytes on the read and the write was actually 2,500 megabytes. Now the interesting thing with the case, with the case on, I was getting temps of around 38 degrees Celsius, which translates to about hundred degrees Fahrenheit, but I ended up taking the lid off of that. And so that temp was actually at 99 degrees Celsius and over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, at that point, I'm pretty sure it's, it's gonna start to throttle. So even having that lid off, of course, that's dissipating the heat, but I just really wanted to see what the chip actually looked like. And, and I, you know, I didn't really wanna test a lot how long I could sustain that, but it definitely got hot. Now transferring that same folder to the extreme SSD, that actually took about eight minutes. Now, of course, I can't take the case off, so the temperatures I was getting was around 51 degrees Celsius and 124 degrees Fahrenheit. Now recapping those numbers on the render and export on the NVMe, we actually got on that 4K timeline a read and write, so peak read and write of 141 and 291 respectively. Now the render time actually took 12 minutes and 24 seconds. Now again, talking about that read and write and what the drive is capable of, there's gonna be some bottleneck in the Thunderbolt 3, but also the fact of just the program itself. Now, here's the thing with that SLC cache that the, the drive actually has, that's where these NLEs, these video editors, uh, they like to put that into the cache. And, and honestly, I wasn't really seeing that max out at all. And that's one of the advantages of this NVMe. And of course, I will link up the details so that you can do your own research. And of course, adding to that render, just as far as your workflow is concerned, budgeting that time, we saw that on that 4K timeline to export it took seven minutes and 11 seconds. And of course the peak read and write was 243 megabytes per second and 343 megabytes per second. Now moving over to the SanDisk Extreme Pro. And so if those of you who have invested in that or Samsung T7, I wanted to do that for you. So the peak read and write on that render was 104 megabytes per second and 190 megabytes per second as far as the peak read and write. Now the render time actually took 12 minutes and 30 seconds, very close to the render time of the NVMe. Now the export time was also interesting in getting a peak read and write of 243 on the read and 313 on the write, but the fact that it exported in seven minutes and 45 seconds, again, still close to the NVMe. Now I wanted to do an internal render and export just for comparison. And the interesting thing is, is with the internal render on that 4K, the read and write, so that was 394 megabytes and the write was over a thousand megabytes uh, in the internal. And the render time was 10 minutes and 56 seconds, which is really interesting. Again, fairly close to the SanDisk and the uh, Silicon Power NVMe. Now the export time, so the read and write on that was 494 megabytes per second and 1300 megabytes per second on that, on that export. And that export time, now that was four minutes and 10 seconds. So 
quite a bit, you know, three minutes as far as getting it done sooner. Um, but again, three minutes for many of you out there that might not be that big of a deal. Now for the pros out there, you know, you're cutting each and every day, three minutes can certainly add up. But again, not that significant. Now, one of the interesting things is, is that when we look at the read and write compared to the Intel machine and the M1, the thing with the M1 is that we are finding that there's something going on with the Thunderbolt 3 communication. And I don't know, I don't think this is hardware. I do think this is something that is related to Big Sur. Anybody in the community, because I'm just one man here and I'm trying, I've worked days on this trying to figure things out. The only thing that I can come up with is that this is a kernel issue, something in the code um, with the x86 architecture or having Big Sur on these Intel machines. And it's not completely fully optimized, even though this is Apple's ecosystem for the chipset itself and for these uh, for the bus, so for the Thunderbolt 3 ports. But anybody can weigh in, hit me up in the comment section below, help the community out, help me out, because I've been kind of trying to figure this out myself. But the NVMe on the Intel, I was getting 2665 and 2655. Now on the NVMe on the M1, this was interesting. I was getting 2800 and 1150. So again, very interesting here um, that it would be cut basically in half. So like I said, not sure if that's a kernel issue, something with Big Sur. I really hope that there's an update. And if there is, I will certainly update you all. Now, Black Magic on the M1, this is interesting. And again, you know, all of these synthetic benchmarks have their own way of doing these things. So Black Magic on the M1 was 2524 and 2527. So again, you know, take that as you will, I'm taking the real benchmarks that I'm getting from my actual workflow. And of course, the extreme on the Intel, uh, 1033 and 995. Now, extreme on the M1, 745 and 854. And of course, the internal in the M1, that was 3367 and 3211. So in real workflow here, not just synthetic benchmarks, does that slow down in Thunderbolt 3? Is that concerning? Well, we know that this is really efficient and being able to provide us with a little bit more future and having an enclosure like this. Now the enclosure, this one was around 150, whereas the NVMe or the SSD that is in here was also around $150. So you're coming in at around 300 US, whereas a terabyte, this is a terabyte, but this is also a terabyte coming in anywhere from 129 to maybe 160, 169, depending on the sales and where you are um, for a terabyte. You know, here's the thing, like, yes, this is less expensive on the front end, but will this give me more longevity and more upgrade ability down the road? Because if Thunderbolt 4 comes around anytime soon, then just using the same SSD, but a different enclosure and then getting closer to those rated and advertised read and write speeds. And of course, talking about your purchases that you made, if you bought the SanDisk Extreme Pro or a Samsung T5 or T7, I, I don't think that you made a bad decision there because we're talking about real world workflow here. And if you're someone who has already purchased or is thinking about purchasing an enclosure like this and putting in an SSD, I also think that that is a good investment as well. So it's just not for everyone doing this DIY kind of stuff and trying to figure these things out. It's not for everyone because some people just want to be able to pick this up, plug it in. It's very lightweight, very portable. Not to say that this is not either, but this definitely has a much smaller footprint and is definitely more ubiquitous out there in, in the world of just mobile computing and even desktop computing. So as more data comes in, I will certainly update you in the comment section below because this is where I am. I'm also over on Twitter. So as stuff comes in and if you find out some things, definitely hit me up in the comment section below or over on Twitter so that we can share that with the community and help each other out, especially making these buying decisions. You go out there and do those things that matter. You keep rocking the faces. And if you've made it this far, I really appreciate your time and attention on this one. Go do those things. I'm gonna keep doing this stuff here and providing you with some value. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll catch you right back here on the next one.